So this is my second talk, which was supposed to be in the Rhinology session, but as you say, Jaydeep is, is parking his car. So this is called nasal emergencies. I have not, I have not done this talk with Masterclass, and this one is done with a, an SPR who's currently with us, will be with us till next week. He's giving his exam. In fact, this week, the intercollegiate is Sam. So acknowledgement to Sam and Phoebe and people who make our lives easier because he's done the heavy lifting on this one. So Shahid had asked me to do nasal emergencies, and he'd asked me specifically to focus on three subtypes, the septal and nasal trauma, CSF, rhino, and facial fractures. And Sam being Sam, this is a slight heavy talk. There's, I think, 60 or 61 uh, slides, but we don't need to focus on all of them intensely. Some of them we can fly over. So when we talk of septal and nasal trauma, we're talking essentially of the pyramid of the nose. And it's important to remember the nose, as always, within the larger context of the face. We know it occupies the mid-third. It has a significant cosmetic aspect to how we look, how we present ourselves. And it has a bony and a cartilaginous uh, subset. So in broad terms, you can take the nose and artistically divide it. And I don't think you can do rhinology without having a certain steer towards art, because you need to be able to draw things out in your mind. Exactly like with otology, you need to have a certain three-dimensionality about how, what you're doing. But the nose and, and drawing things out comes nearly hand in hand. So I would suggest anyone who's looking at doing rhinology, it's useful to start drawing your, your findings out just so that you know where you're at. The nasal complex itself is three-part in, in total, the osseous framework, the cartilaginous framework, and then the septum. And the three of them, and especially the septum, are actually particularly not, not uh, quite brittle. And they don't stand impact very well. They're not geared to, to take a lot of trauma. And unfortunately, they do take a lot of trauma for the same reason as we talked about the year, because anyone who wants to uh, tell you that they don't like you throws a punch at your face, road traffic accidents, you and the steering wheel, and sports. You lead with your head. Rugby, football, quite a lot of boxing. So you end up with a lot of nasal injuries. And as Shahid said, that if you look at the emergency department of any busy hospital, within the context of acute emergencies, rhinology probably is up on the top with epistaxis, nasal injuries, and infections. The osseous framework, just broadly, is paired nasal bones, the right and the la left uh, uh, nasal bones, and the cartilaginous framework looking from the front are the two upper lateral cartilages, the low lateral cartilage, the ala cartilages, and several smaller cartilages dotted around, which is probably the domain of the rhinoplastic surgeon. But from a trauma point of view, these are the three important ones. The lower two obviously form the tip, and the upper one gives a sense of support and prevents collapse of the, of the nasal vault. The septum itself comprises of both cartilage and bone. The cartilage is called the quadrilateral cartilage. It's quite large. It's roughly quadrilateral. And the bone consists of the propenic plate of the ethmoid and the boma rising up to meet it. And they sit on the crest of the maxilla. And the palatine is the fourth bone that makes it up. And if you look at a skull, a desiccated skull, I looked at one at the Dones exam in London this time, only a couple of weeks ago. You actually find that the bony part of the septum is not insignificant. It's actually quite large. When you're doing a septoplasty, you often think, or I often find that it, I, I get the feeling that it's a thin plate of bone extending from there to there. But if you look at a skull in its entirety, the perpendicular plate of the ethmoid and the boma form a rather large shelf of bone. So just to keep that in mind. So when you get a nasal uh, fracture, nasal trauma, fracture of the nasal bones with some injury to the septum is common. So the combination of a fracture of nasal bones with some shearing or some injury to the septum is what happens in most patients, caused usually by trauma, either from the, from the front or from the side. And obviously, the depth or the, the extent of the injury is related to the magnitude of the force, the angulation of the force, and whether the nose has been previously broken, as often happens in sports athletes. So when you're looking at the nasal bones, although they are one-third of the nose, the fracture often happens in the lower portion of that one-third and seldom in the upper portion because the upper portion is hitched quite strongly to the frontals. And you, if you were to get an injury there, you'd need a fair amount of force to break the bone at that point, which is why you, when you're doing rhinoplasty as well, your topmost osteotomy and your transverse are the most difficult because the bone is the thickest and your lower osteotomies are the easiest. So there's a close association between the nasal bone fractures or nasal bone injuries and the underlying cartilage. And if one doesn't, again, have a three-dimensional view as to how that happens, quite often you get a drift when you repair these, bone, uh, these injuries, and you tend to get a drift because the cartilage has swung the bones back, or you get a subsequent septal deviation because you haven't corrected it at the time. So when you're thinking of nasal injuries, it's worthwhile thinking of the septum and the bony part together. <laughs>
The two types of bony injuries that we see that we repair the most are angulated injuries, so side to side, or simply a depressed injury if you get a front on blow. So depending on whether the blow is from lateral or the front, uh, the frontal blow, what happens is, and there are a lot of textbooks right now, good rhinology textbooks, Moran, uh, uh, there's a lot of books that give schematic diagrams of this, but the nasal bones get pushed in and they get splayed. And sometimes you get what looks like an open book or an open roof type deformity where the nasal bones simply move aside because of the, of the angulation of the force. The septum, of course, gets collapsed and you can end up then with a saddle nose deformity either on, at the time or later on as resorption and lack of support happens. If there's a frontal blow, Usually a frontal blow it gives, a, gives a straight line of energy and is a greater force attendant on the, on the uh, nose, whereas a lateral blow or an angulated blow often causes a shearing injury. So then if you have a full-on frontal blow, like blow, as happens in a road traffic accident with the steering wheel, if the airbag hasn't deployed, you get a comminuted fracture, which may extend onto the frontal process of the maxilla, and you may get a full flattening and widening of the nasal dorsum. You're then in the realm of Lefort-type injuries, which we'll come to briefly in the third part of the talk, but that is probably one where you need an open reduction, and that's not just a manipulation of nasal bones. The ones that we use the manipulation for are lateral blow injuries where the nose is displaced away, as you can see here. You may get a depression of the nasal bone, and if you don't repair that, quite often patients will then be satisfied that you've got a good lie to the nasal bone, but they will be dissatisfied that you haven't taken the time to elevate that nasal bone, click it into place, perhaps put a little pack in for a night or even for a few hours, but make sure that this doesn't stay as a deformity within a straight corrected nose. You also have to remember sometimes the septum will have been fractured, as I say, and there are classification systems for the septum as well. The classification systems for injuries to the nose are based on the direction of the force, the site of the fracture, and the cosmetic deformity and what you see. And when you look up the literature, there are any number of classification systems. So Lipinski is the one that Sam uh, picked out. It's a reasonable one. I don't think you need this much uh, insight into the type of injury unless you're doing uh, exquisite repair work. But there are many, many other. Julian Rowe has one. Uh, Arnold Moran had one as well. Uh, so if for, for, for nothing else other than interest, you might want to take a look at these. Again, for the septum, the classic ones, the two classic ones that have been described right from Scott Brown onwards are the Jarjaway or Harjaway, which is a uh, secondary to a blow from the front. And typically, the blow causes a, a crack in the septum there. And then you get a septal spur or a movement of the septum at that point. It goes up to the perpendicular ethmoid, often doesn't touch the perpendicular ethmoid, but it literally turns or divides the quadrilateral cartilage into two. So the fracture line is above the anterior nasal spine and then goes along the vomerine edge. Chevrolet is the other one. Uh, it's, a, it's secondary to a blow from below, not blow, sorry. So it comes from below, so that's usually a boxer uppercut. So the fracture line is more vertical and it takes the anterior spine away from its hitching so that you can end up with a tip droop or a tip collapse. So these are the two commoner types of septal fractures that you get. Of course, not every injury follows these lines. So you can get any number of combinations. What you need to know for septal and nasal fractures is where the injury is located. Is it the sidewall, the dorsum, or the entire nasal bone? Is it the right or the left? Concurrent facial bones and nasal septum. And of course, when you have an injury to the, to the middle third of the face, epistaxis is a concern. You need to check for the eyes, the lamina, and skull injuries, head, head injuries, because this is, again, like the ear, you need to look at it in the, in the fullness of a full-on head injury. Do you need an x-ray? Don'ts. I think don'ts is past this point as well. I think generally we agree that we don't. There is a certain medical legal aspect, at least in, the, in Ireland, where they expect us to do, do x-rays. I don't. Why do we not do x-rays? Because the role in, in fractures is minimal. 50% or more uh, do not reveal an, uh, a fracture that's there. So the sensitivity and specificity the sensitivity and specificity of an x-ray, plain x-ray, is minimal, paltry, and we don't do them. So how do you man manage nasal bones and uh, septal injuries? Again, there's a window of time in which to do this. We, call, we say we should do them within about three weeks' time, or the earlier the better. Um, we do tend to wait a bit till the swelling resolves. In adults, it's usually five to ten days, so we call them back in a week. Children resolve their injury or their edema and, and swelling much quicker, so we call them back within a week or less, and we often get to know then how the final look is going to be. And then, depending on what we've done, we end up watching them for a little while, 
the complications of injuries can be, or complications of treatment even, can be a septal hematoma, a cosmetic deformity with a residual deficit, tip deviation, tip droop, or a saddle deformity. The complication of the injury itself set against the head injury backdrop is CSF leaks, orbital injuries, or head skull base injuries as well. These are the quick tips as to how we reduce them. You can do them on the local anesthetic or on the general anesthetic. We tend to use a local list to do these and take some of them to general anesthetic for a quick uh, short burst of a general anesthetic. Usually we do them by a simple push. You can use a Walsham's forceps for close reduction. Uh, we sometimes, and Javed and I have talked about this, do a septal manipulation at the same time, and if the septum is simply has come off its moorings, we bring it back onto the, onto the maxillary crest, and it does tend to work. And I find, especially in children who often have these green stick fractures where they're not really broken, they're just sheared, it tends to work quite well. So septal deviations can be treated at the same time. Some people, a lot of people, would often prefer to wait till the injury has been settled, and there's, then they get a better... Uh, view. Of course, if there's a comminated fracture or a straight-on fracture, then you do an open reduction. An open reduction gives you advantages insofar as you can reconstruct uh, from top down. Uh, we don't do them. It's probably the purview where we come, where, where, where I work uh, of the plastic surgery department. But that's a broad outline of nasal and sinus or nose and sinus fractures. My second topic is based or linked to the first one, CSF rhinorrhea and the reasons for CSF rhinorrhea largely are traumatic. 96% uh, of patients, whether it's surgical or non-surgical, but it's usually due to an injury. These are the figures that are good to keep from an exam perspective. Non-surgical is 80 to 74 to 80% or 80 to 84%. 2 to 3% of major head trauma has a CSF leak, and that's not a CSF leak only through the nose, but also a CSF leak into the middle ear. So you need to be careful or need to think of the skull base in head neck trauma, so it's worthwhile keeping that in mind. Uh, iatrogenic trauma, obviously, FES, functional endoscopic sinus surgery, especially for um, near, the lab, near, near the cribriform plate would be the most uh, common cause. Nasal polypectomies and relatively simple uh, excisions can also, and indeed, septoplasty sometimes can cause, a sept can cause a CSF leak if there is a certain amount of manipulation just at the top. We know that the cribriform plate is extremely thin. In fact, the thinnest part of the skull base is the lateral lamina of the cribriform plate. So sometimes, rarely, you can actually get a CSF leak by instrumenting the septum or doing a simple nasal polypectomy. You don't have to necessarily do a full fez to expect a CSF leak. So the aim of the exercise is always to be aware, beware, and manipulate as gently as possible. Skull base surgery and hypophysectomies, obviously there would be a higher incidence of CSF rhinorrhea. Not all CSF rhinorrhea is traumatic. 4% or less is due to non-traumatic causes. And of those, high pressure leaks are about half, just short of a half. And you can get normal pressure leaks as well. And we are doing a study now for spontaneous CSF otoria in terms of the fact that Tegman breaches may also cause spontaneous leakage of CSF into the middle ear because we have patients that come to us, adult patients that come with unilateral effusions. And you put a grommet in, grommet comes out, effusions builds up again. And possibly those patients may have a breach of the Tegman antri or the Tegman tympani, and they may have CSF causing that fluid collection rather than a pure otitis media. But in the nose, it is important to remember that about four to five percent, four to six percent of your CSF rhinorrhea will not be traumatic, and they need to be treated or investigated with care. So how do you how do you investigate them? The more the commonest causes of a traumatic, the commonest timeline is within 48 hours, but you can get leaks up to three months after uh, operating on the nose or after the trauma. The most common site, of course, is the lateral lamina, as I said. The frontal sinus is another commonish sort of site because sometimes the frontal sinus floor will be thinned out, and then the middle cranial fossa, sphenoid sinus injury, is another site. The symptoms we know, unilateral clear rhinorrhea is a red flag. It increases in the supine position associated with headaches. The diagnosis is the halo or ring sign, glucose testing, beta protein or beta transferring. The halo or ring sign is not specific to CSF. It's just the play between the, uh, I think, the, the molar coefficients of the glucose, so it tends to take a second orbit to the blood. But it's an easy-to-do test. You can do it in the, in the ward, and the CSF tends to gravitate away from the blood on blotting paper. The glucose test, 
Again, it's not very sensitive, but these are the figures, greater than 30 milligrams in CSF and less than 10 in nasal discharge. So there is a fair amount of difference between the two. Beta, trans, beta protein is specific for CSF, but it's not as sensitive for beta, as beta 2 transferrin. So we send off, like we have a patient in the ward right now, we send off for beta 2 transferrin because that's not only sensitive, it's specific for CSF. We just need a little bit of it, and it's a good test to do. So the diagnosis of CSF is on diagnostic endoscopy and imaging. Your imaging is on thin-cut coronals where you often get to see the breach. Um, and of course, if you see fluid coming down on endoscopy, then that would be a, an indication along with the clinical features. CSF, CT cystinography would be useful, and MRI is another way to look for, uh, especially T2 would be a good way to check for uh, CSF leaks. Management, we know what we do initially, conservative management, which is bed rest, head elevation, avoid increase in pressure, so the avoid sneezing, avoid, st uh, avoid straining at stools, prophylactic antibiotics, you can give diuretics as well. 80% of traumatics, exactly the same figure as 80% of traumatic perforations, 80 tympanic membrane perforations, 80% of traumatic CSF leaks respond well to conservative management. In other words, if you have a traumatic non-infective leak, the likelihood, and if it's small, the likelihood is that it will settle with time. Operative repair, again, you then need to have more distinct, precise information as to where the leak is. Intrathecal fluorescein is important. I'm told by Sam that this is not, a, not, a, not approved in the UK, and I'm intrigued, so maybe someone might tell me whether that is the case or how you investigate uh, CSF leaks before they go to theater. And then the treatment is basically layering uh, the leak. So dura is removed, a temporalis fascia graft is placed and tucked in, and then it's supported by free mucosal graft or uh, fibrin, with or without fibrin glue. And there are different types, on layer pair, the controversies are as to what type of repair happens and whether you pack. And most people will take one of, will take, uh, there are views on either side of that argument. Some people, including my colleagues in Beaumont, tend not to pack. Sometimes people will use packing. Uh, it depends, I presume, on personal experience. Bed rest and a lumbar drain is important, and that prevents uh, the, or reduces the likelihood of recurrence of the CSF coronary. Facial fractures is my third topic, but I'm aware that it, spills over slightly into the maxillofacial session. Uh, Sam has been a bit enthusiastic and he's given some exquisite details on Lefort clarification. classification. We don't need to go over all of them, but generally, facial fractures are caused by motor vehicle accidents, assaults, falls, and other. And the treatment is embedded, once again, within the concept of head injuries and overall injuries. So you can get flattened cheeks, and it's important to think of the structures that may be associated with it, so the zygomatic gets broken, either on the arch or in the front, you can get a mid-dish face, which is the mid-face literally collapses in, like a Lefort II. Uh, nasoethmoid fractures, which are obviously the ones we see most often, and one has to remember the fact that the orbital floor or the orbital lateral wall may be involved, so you can get a drop, and you need to check external ocular movements, check for the pupils, diplopia, and all of the above. So this picture is a typical one where the orbital floor has collapsed, so the eyeball has collapsed down, and obviously EOMs will be affected as well. CSF rhinorrhea, as we say, is a possibility. In addition, if the orbital wall has been fractured, you often get a subconjital hemorrhage without a posterior border, which means you can't see white when you ask the patient to move laterally. And that is a key sign to tell us that there is a breach or a break of the orbital wall. There is numbness of the cheek, so that's due to the infraorbital nerve or the mandibular fractures causing inferior dental nerve. He's just repeated that twice. And then, you have to remember that if the sinuses get involved, you can get facial fractures extending into the sinuses causing emphysema and a breach of air into the soft tissue of the face. From a maxillofacial point of view, we need to look at the, at the dentition, at the jaws, at the teeth, so on and so forth, and the base of the skull, the typical raccoon eyes, hemotympanum, CSF rhinorrhea, and battle sign. This is facial fractures in a quick view. I'm going to go over these because he has gone into, yeah. So Lefort classification, I think this is about as much as we need. I, I, I don't think we'd be asking in the exams, either interclesure or don'ts, anything more than what the three Lefort fractures are. This is what they are. Those are the schematic uh, pictures. They're available in most textbooks. Uh, the Lefort one is a low-level fracture, so it's a transverse fracture. And it's divided into one A and 
point B. I'm going to go with that. Lefort two is a pyramidal fracture, so it doesn't go horizontally. It goes up and takes that hard nasal bone at the root and goes down back. So it almost disengages the mid third of the face. Again, it's divided into 2A and 2B. I don't think we need to know that. Uh, and Lefort three is where there's a total disjunction of the craniofacial skeleton. So you actually end up with a two-piece skeleton, which of course is the most severe form. And I'm going to go over the subgroups of that. I'm going to go. So in a nutshell, that takes care, I think, rather well of the of the nose and sinus and gives a broad view of facial fractures or, or maxillofacial fractures. CSF rhinorrhea is a pet theme in the intercollegiate. I've, I've seen it in the MCQs and it comes up in the Dones exam as well in terms of investigation, diagnosis, and treatment. So uh, again, any questions, comments about fluorescein or otherwise, or any other questions? I'm done. <laughs>